Uh, hey everyone, my name's Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns he and his. Uh, today I'll be speaking about how APIs create government as a platform. Because I've got lots of links and uh, images through this, here's the bit.ly link if you want to actually follow along from Google Slides. So just quickly about me. My background is I've worked in public health and urban planning where I built a lot of um, city dashboards for governments around Australia. And for the last 10 years I've worked in the API sector as a writer and analyst and consultant. I'm currently consulting with um, <coughs> the APIs for digital government team and I'm also founder of um, Platformable. And Platformable's work is trying to encourage business and government to build platforms where everyone can co-create the value that, that they want. So I'm really grateful for uh, industry leaders like Kin Lane and Steve Wilmot who've sort of really encouraged me or inspired me to think about um, the, the sort of value I want to play in the API economy and it's really about that co-creation of value and participation. And then with the APIs for Digital Government Study, um, here's the link to the uh, website page. I've made it a um, short link as well. Um, and I'd like to thank my, um, the uh, JRC members, Lorenzino in particular, Monica, uh, Demetrius and Dipmar, and then also uh, the team that I work with, Isabel Medi and Shelby Switzer, who's not here at API Days this time. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about was some current thoughts on creating an API framework for all uh, EU government activities. So as Lorenzino and Dipmar both um, talked about, we started with a literature review of API best practices. And so the methodology for this was we collected what we could find around APIs and best practices in government. We looked at what some of the best, what the best documents were out of that, and we've written some of that up. And then we've looked at all of the sort of recommendations and best practices that are being used around the world and across Europe, and we've sort of put them into a document. So we did a search of um, these keyword terms on the right, and we came up with 3,900 links, of which only 968 actually mentioned APIs. Out of those, 343 were relevant to our study, um, and that included 67 government guidelines. And then we've come up with a range of like best practices or ideas. There were 74 at a strategic level, which is sort of a whole of government level, um, 41 at a tactical level, which is the sort of like a departmental level, and then 55 which are operational, like how would you actually implement this stuff. So, I wanted to take back, I really liked this um, API Agro talk about starting with use cases and then a lot of the principles um, that uh, Dipmar mentioned, for example, they were talking about user-centred principles when you're thinking about APIs and digital services. So I want to look at a sort of use case example. So, who in here, by the way, is from government? And who is from industry or startups? Okay, great. So in this case, we're all imagining that we're in a startup. We're trying to start a business. What we want to do is import plant-based protein burgers from Norway into Barcelona. So what would you actually do if this was your business? You would start with doing market research. Then you, if it's viable, then you might want to uh, register your business. Then there's some business uh, administration tasks then you've got to import the plant burgers from Norway, and then you can distribute and sell, uh, sell. So, what's government's role in all of these sorts of functions? I'm going to need my water. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, so then for government roles, first of all with market research, when you're doing that you might actually be needing to look at some consumer expenditure data and the access to that and the aggregated level of that is all governed by GDPR in uh, Europe so then that's a role of government that's taken for that. Then also when you're trying to map out where people are spending money, where the health food stores are and all of the rest, that's organised by geospatial boundaries which government is helping define. So there's a government role in the background behind that. 
For business registration, biz you've got to register your business with government. You might be entitled to rebates. Um, there's tax registration, whole range of other sorts of um, activities there. When you're importing, then there's trade partnerships. There, again, there may be rebates. There's port management that you have to look after, cu uh, customs and all of the rest. Then when you're actually distributing and selling, there's road transport regulations. There might be some um, retail um, sales taxes that you need to collect. There's food safety inspections for something like a food product um, and so on. So there's government roles happening all behind the background there. And normally, as we were talk, uh, as Dipma was talking about earlier, as a business, you have to go to each government department, often replicating the sort of information that you're registering and, uh, and like um, involving individually each department who has no history of your uh, wider sort of use case or um, business idea. So if you're doing this today, you might use something like BBVA's Paystats API, which I think um, BBVA is talking tomorrow morning, and that sort of aggregates consumer expenditure data. So you can have a look at um, how people are um, uh, spending, like what demographics people are spending on health food or on restaurants and that sort of thing, which might be useful for your market research. But as we just heard from the API agro people, when you get that data, you might need to clean it you then need to um, transform it. So if you're using sources like the consumer expenditure, but you're also using that to plot against postcode, you might need to do some transformation to make that correct. You might then want to overlay something from, say, Yelp, where you're looking at, say, the health food outlets that are occurring in the area if you can't get that data from your open data portals. So then you might need... But they might be um, cataloguing the geospatial boundaries for... Um, health food stores differently to how the consumer expenditure data came in. So you need to sort of clean and transform before you can map and understand if there's any viability. So that's even just for the market research component. Then once you've proven that there is a viability, then you might need to online uh, register online for your business. You might hear from word of mouth or from going to industry events that there are rebates available because it's a... Um, uh, because it's in line with um, healthy food consumption goals or something like that from government. And then you need to register for taxation or get an accountant. Then for importing, you need to maybe be part of a um, chamber of commerce group. Um, you might need to apply for rebates. You need to sort of figure out what the port management system is like and so on and so forth with sales and distribution. So there you're using a combination of government sources and industry APIs and data. So, in a platform sort of vision for how APIs might improve or provide more seamless sort of um, use case for this sort of thing, imagine then if your actual starting point was that you're working with the Catalonia and Norway Trade Association. Um, so you go to their website and you find out, oh, because you've got some industry contacts, which is how your plant-based um, burger business was going to start, and on that website, they've got a widget that's in, enabled by an API so you can register your business from that website. So you don't even have to go to the, um, uh, the government's uh, online registration. You can do it straight from there. So that would be one way that APIs might um, enable something like this. Then, um, as we heard from Dipmar around the life transition process, where by 2023 they're going to identify a number of life transitions that you'd be able to... Um, uh, where it's automatically going to be able to... Uh, government's going to be able to inform you of things. In the same way, if you register, then maybe government could be able to tell you about your rebates that you're eligible for, rather than you going to have to search that information. Maybe they could tell you about some port partners so that you could, con you could share a container for um, uh, goods coming from, uh, from, from Norway. And then, of course, there's... <coughs> excuse me. Um, then, of course, there's the automated tax report. So, there, at the moment, um, a couple of governments are actually embedding tax APIs into financial accounting software. So, at any given time, you can put in your um, business expenditure and it will automatically tell you what your, um, uh, what your tax requirements are. 
So all of that sort of vision would mean government as a platform, and I like this sort of um, uh, definition from Margots and Nauman, which says that government as a platform is really about collective action. So it's private and public actors working together through shared software, data and services to improve efficiency and create some common goals. Um, and so some elements of that system uh, that we've got here are actually already happening because there are APIs available. So, for example, in France, there's some labour force, um, business administration and some of that geo data available through their um, employment uh, website, uh, API website. In, the, in Rotterdam, they've actually already moved some of their port management systems into APIs so that there's a much more efficient um, collection of um, your goods at the port, but also you can share containers with other services so that there's actually reduced CO2 e emissions because there's not like half empty containers being shipped around the world. And then there's some work on tax automation going on at the moment in a number of countries that's looking at how do you build APIs that you can then impl uh, implement into your financial accounting software or into other sort of um, uh, business software. So that's your actual engagement with the tax office instead of being directly you having to do another process and submit every three months. Okay. So that's all of the, so if that's the use case, that will be the sort of vision of where platforms would go. How do we get there? We need a sort of evidence-based model and framework. So before I get into the evidence-based model and framework, I just want to talk about one of the key challenges we've got. And that's what we see in government at the moment, which I would call peak ad hoc. So with APIs in industry, we've seen this sort of maturity process. Sorry for the quality of the slide. There's some links there to find out more about this. But basically, APIs started as a one-off. There might be an individual use case or an individual integration that's had to occur. And so they built an API for that. And then across a business, they've seen, oh, that's actually uh, reduced, uh, created efficiencies, reduced costs. Let's do that as well. So another API is built. And then another line of business says, oh, that's a great idea. And so they start building APIs. And then suddenly you've got this whole complex web of APIs. Some of them are very similar. Some of them use different field names in, within the one organisation. And suddenly all of the efficiencies you are starting to gain, you're losing again because there's this new complexity with all of your APIs. So then you start to move to need to move towards an industrial model where you're using things like API standards and API style guides internally, perhaps the same market architecture in order to be building APIs that have a genuine business purpose. And my feeling is that, um, and from reading the literature, this is the stage we're at with government APIs. Um, before we get into the model, I also wanted to point out uh, one of the sort of best practices that we came across uh, from Sweden. And so in Sweden, they've got a geospatial data strategy. What it actually says is that the, for Sweden, they've got a, a um, commitment to the sustainable development goals. So they're an overarching set of goals that occur for the whole of government. And then out of that sustainable development goals, they've identified which ones are relevant for their geospatial data strategy. And then from out of that, they've said, well, we need to build our geospatial data strategy in line with European um, uh, best practice, uh, European policies like the INSPIRE directive and the EU spatial data in infrastructure policy. So they're going to build the geospatial um, data APIs in line with that. So they've, uh, so they've identified that there's the, so, uh, the sustainable development goals. They've said APIs are the best way to achieve those goals. We're going to do those APIs in the format that's prescribed or, or um, uh, encouraged by the, um, uh, by the EU policies, and then we'll be able to create maps and create some standards, and that will have benefits. So, we ne so that's the sort of approach we need for all of this. So, so what's needed to create that sort of platform vision? So we need the starting place to actually be the policy so um, we heard a range of the different policies from DIPMAR around the Open Data and Public Sector Initiative Directive, the Once Only Principle, the Talent Declaration, and then there's a whole series 
of um, reports like uh, strategies like the e-government action plan and all of the rest. So there's all of those and they all have clearly identified goals for the next four years in, or, or even for longer time frames. In addition to that, there is a more general um, sort of uh, social, social um, uh, business-wide sort of goals around sustainable development. And so they're your, they're your more peak, go peak goals, things like reducing or eliminating poverty, um, improve, uh, reducing carbon emissions, um, improving climate resilience, um, improving local economic development, all of those sorts of goals. So they're the sort, they're the real, th that's the real work of government. That's what government's trying to achieve. Then the things like e-government action plans is almost like how we're going to do that in some ways, or these are the principles we uphold in trying to achieve these sorts of goals and in carrying out government operations. So out of both of those, you sort of get a list of all of these government strategies or government action, uh, uh, sort of action goals that are needed to be done. So then what I would think, and this is where we're trying to think through the um, literature review, is the idea would well, there, there be the, these two overarching policy goals first. And then once you've identified those, and maybe you've even set some priorities about your top 10 or something like that out of it, you say, OK, out of these 10 goals, which ones w w will APIs help you achieve with, uh, these goals? You know? And so some of them might not actually be API oriented. They're more skills development or something like that. But a large number of them will be API relevant as far as making sure that data is connected and shared, um, that uh, industry partnerships are able to work collaboratively, and so on. So, and that's where the API framework would sit. So the API framework is uh, underneath the policy, policy goals and the policy strategy. But it's trying to say that if you do the, um, you want to do the API framework in a way that it can um, help you achieve any of those policy goals. So if it's going to achieve any of those policy goals, then it needs to have three additional components. One is sort of a platform focus that we're all familiar with, with our other API work. So it needs shared data models, a common or a distributed architecture, an ecosystem standards. I'll go into those issues in a little bit. Then it needs people, so it needs governance structures that's going to be able to check that you're able to build APIs that address risk, um, that you're able to build the sort of teams that include both policy and technical involvement, and that you take a sort of product management approach um, to your work. And then you actually need the processes. So you need principles in place, which we've got uh, by and large in a, across a number of the strategies. They've all got some core principles, and we heard of seven from Dipmar as well. Um, and then we need things like REST APIs. This is, to me, this is where um, a lot of the strategies and action plans fall, fall short and don't actually give you enough guidance. Because a lot of them will say, we need the once only principle. And OK, that might be fine for like a 20 year plan. But then the four year plan, like the e-government action plan that's meant to be like stepping towards that overarching goal, it won't actually say APIs in, in that document. And, it doesn't, and then within that, it doesn't say REST APIs. So then you've got a whole range of different business activities across government going, well, we'll do SOAP services then, or we'll do web-based you know, web services. So, because that's what our existing legacy infrastructure is, and we'll just keep going with that. So there's not quite the opinionated need for REST APIs. And I know we've heard in talks this morning that um, REST is, uh, you know, like in 20 years, we might be somewhere else other than REST. But I think for now, REST is sort of the industry standard for APIs. It's been great that in the past six months to a year, there's been some new documents that are finally mentioning APIs and finally even sort of mentioning REST. But I think we need to be more opinionated about that because at the moment, there's still too many SOAP services being delivered and everyone's content with that because it sort of ticks off the uh, reuse and the um, once only principle box. But we know when, when you're trying to use those sorts of APIs, that's not really the case. 
So this happened about 10 minutes ago. Um, so the French Ministry of Agriculture, what I really loved about the start of this presentation was that it was actually saying, you know, was actually that model of the policy first. So it was saying, you know, like there are external public policies that the Ministry of Agriculture is needing to, um, uh, to, to try to um, move towards achieving. And it also has principles from the digital single market type work, which is the Tell Us Once program. So they're, they're already saying that. So they've got this work around the, um, the goals in place, the policy work in place. And then I was really, um, I loved hearing this thing about the ecosystem as well. So the consortium. So as um, Demetrius was saying, that was really um, one of the highlights of the day, really. So they, they were saying that it's very important to work with state stakeholders beginning an agricultural ecosystem of like private and public people, and that it would, it would include um, then identifying some of the relevant use cases. So there is a number of bits of work that's been done towards an API framework. I'm not going to have a chance to go through all of these today, um, but here's some of them. I'll talk about a few. Um, so there is the prioritised ecosystems. We heard from um, French agricultural um, uh, departments. So I won't go into that again. There's shared capabilities. So um, as a, so, in when you're going to any government department, quite often you need to um, share your identity to verify your identity before you can register for the business. Then you need to go to the tax um, website and register there and verify your identity there as well. So. In Singapore, they've actually built an API for identity verification that's now used by 17 government departments and then externally by banks um, when they're wanting to offer loans or set up new accounts and all of the rest. So there is sort of so now you only just do this one. Um, once you've put in your paperwork and proved your identity and you get your code, you can use any of the government websites because they're all linked by the API. In Denmark, there's this study here, and it's saying that um, when people in Denmark have tried to use multiple websites, which are based on SOAP, um, by and large, they've gone to each of those websites, had to register, had to do all of that sort of thing. 77% said that they didn't think authorities were good at working cohesively. Like it was, uh, was what Dima was saying as far as having to register for his son's gender every, um, uh, every couple of years. So that's one area of work is so that what you would do is identify some of those shared capabilities that every government department is going to use and then you actually um, work to sort of put them, um, uh, put them in place. Uh, with the shared data models is another bit of the work. So the idea here and there's a new um, catalogue coming of services coming out that's looked at a, a, um, a uh, shared data model from ISA squared and from Digit and it's saying that there's a common data need, a model is needed to facilitate the creation of APIs. And so they've got some work that's done um, around harmonising um, information for public services. So they worked with a number of stakeholders in an ecosystem type environment to be able to define that shared model. Um, the, then there's some API standards work. If everyone was using the same sort of API standards and repeating the work, then there'd be less, um, uh, there'd be less complexity um, for developers using the APIs. It's faster to be able to integrate um, across a, a number of different services. And here's some examples of some work being done. Jacques Putz is speaking tomorrow in our workshop around how he has, as part of a um, bank open banking platform, how they use PSD2 standards. We've got St Stefano speaking later today around Fireware and their smart cities context broker. Um, uh, for API standards and then there's been work done by people like um, uh, Six Acre which used to be City SDK in Finland which was like six cities looking at standardised APIs for cities. Um, and then there's a single point of access is another part of your framework components. So instead, so it's great to have an agricultural department with their own um, entry point there for um, public and private data, so you can get everything in the one spot. There is also the need within government 
for an API portal that's got all of government's APIs so that a government, so that you're not needing to have to navigate. So in the use case, you shouldn't need to know you go to business registration for one thing, you go to food safety for another, you look through three or four different websites for potential rebates. It should all be there in the one spot. Um, and we've got uh, Marco speaking about this from um, E015 after me. Um, so the problem with all of this activity though, is that there's all of these individual bits of work that are being done, um, but it's really still the APIs are like the tail wagging the dog. So what I mean by that is um, if you put in all of these different APIs, you're going to fundamentally change how government does its work. So for example, um, there'll be changes to funding mechanisms and cross-collaborative bodies. So um, there won't necessarily be, uh, so for in this sort of model, um, a one government department might actually need to use another government department's data sets, for example, or buy a similar sort of data set from uh, a private source. Okay, thanks. But at the moment, our funding mechanisms don't encourage that sort of sharing of data. It's often, it's more that um, you should buy your own because if I use someone else's, then I don't need all of my budget, so my budget will be reduced. And also, if I'm using other sources and we're doing a collaborative um, portal or an ecosystem type approach, what does the minister get to launch for my department at the end of the year? So all of these questions around, it's really that sort of power dynamics, the funding mechanisms, that hasn't been really resolved yet. And platforms will force this sort of issue along. As well, like there's also, a, a, we, I don't think we've talked through enough. I know we've got enough on privacy with GDPR and all of the rest, but I don't know that the, um, con the social contract with citizens is clear enough about the once only principle. Like are we actually talking about how we share data between government agencies, how do we know what data of ours is being used by various government agencies? So we almost need like a data bank so we can see what governments have accessed our personal data, uh, for example, that, those sorts of rights. At the moment in the UK, there's, it turns out that there's, with their digital services platform, it turns out that the current government is trying to prioritise collecting usage data from that platform so that they can better send out promotional campaign emails about Brexit based off the digital services platform usage data. And that's sort of contrary to what the f idea of the digital services platform is, but there's not enough of that background work around the, um, what I call the why. You know, why are we moving towards this platform? What will government as a platform actually look like? What are we on board for with that? So that, I think that work is still needed to be done. I've got to wrap up in one minute. So I'll just say that the other bit of work I haven't spoken about here today is governance. But the, again, you're going to need these cross-government um, bodies who are going to be able to look at what your priorities around APIs are. Um, are they being developed to, the to your government industry standards? Um, and then you're going to need metrics because your APIs, you don't want your APIs to just be measuring whether they're performant. You actually want to measure whether or not they're achieving those policy goals. So for example, in our use case, it should actually, your API man a framework should in the end be able to push data so that you're able to say, see that along the way, um, because of how APIs have helped um, implement government goals, that you're able to do faster business setup, which has increased local economies, that you've got reduced CO2 emissions, and so on. Um, there's a range of things that you can do. The two I'd point out would be participate in the workshop tomorrow, and there is a current study on the digital economy, so you can actually um, look that up on the European Union website and comment on um, your APIs, uh, what APIs you need and how you want to be involved. Um, and so then finally we're going to be doing, this is sort of the work from here, but you'll hear more about that tomorrow from Lauren Zeno in any case. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mark. That was really cool. Uh, we don't have time for a question, but anyway, if someone has a question, let's take the time for a quick one. No, yes? It's just a quick one. Um, my name is Adriana. The question is related to data ownership. Some, some of the key 
uh, things like, you know, we, we understand the government owns a lot of like social political data yeah. that, that technically should be shared. But at the same time, if I acquire data, like, you know, and next with that data, what happens? Uh, so you acquire private data. So, uh, so then if there should be like data, so there should be data custodians for um, high value public data sets within government. When you then take that data and you're adding your own to it, you own that. If there is, uh, you know, hopefully under this sort of API framework, if there was value that you were then creating and if it wasn't um, being commercially incompetent or uh, revealing any private information, you might want to share that back with your ecosystem, you know, but that will be sort of your decision sort of thing, I guess, would be how I'd see it, but yeah. Mm -hmm.